Now, tonight, tensions are escalating between the UK and Ireland as the asylum debate takes centre stage. Downing Street is standing firm, refusing to take back asylum seekers from Ireland until the EU-wide asylum rules are revised and France takes migrants who cross to here, to England, often by boat across the English Channel. The disagreement comes as Ireland rushes to implement emergency laws to stem the rising tide of asylum seekers who are crossing its border with Northern Ireland. The Irish government blames a recent surge in asylum seekers on the UK government's Rwanda policy that only, only became law last Thursday. Remember, though, Mikhail Martin, at the time the Prime Minister of Ireland in March 2022, he said the following, We have an open border with Northern Ireland. That's not going to change, be that for pandemic reasons or be that for refugee reasons. So what has changed? Because something clearly has well, earlier today, UK and Irish ministers met to discuss their asylum arrangements. And GB News's Home and Security Editor Mark White has been following this story across the day. Mark, good evening. Uh, good evening to you. What an extraordinary uh, comeuppance may be uh, for, for, for Ireland demanding during the, during, the, during the talks on Brexit and open border, and now they're concerned about that same open border. Yeah, well, not just that. For years, there has been a loophole, as it has been described by Dublin, which has worked exactly the other way, in that many migrants have taken uh, advantage of open borders in Europe to enter Ireland and then to come up through that uh, border uh, into the United Kingdom uh, through into Northern Ireland and across on ferries uh, to the UK mainland. That has been happening for years and has been of significant concern uh, to ministers here uh, in London. So now we have a situation where, according to Dublin, they are saying that 80% of those asylum seekers that they are now seeing in Ireland, they believe are coming from the north of Ireland. Now, that's being disputed by some of the human rights charities in Ireland at the moment because the government seems to be basing their assessment on the fact that the vast majority of those who are claiming asylum are doing it through the International uh, Protection uh, Office in Dublin rather than at airports and ports. Uh, however, these charities say that just because they're not uh, actually applying for asylum immediately they land or arrive at a ferry port doesn't mean that they've come from uh, Northern Ireland down. It may just be that they've delayed their uh, decision to actually uh, claim asylum. So that 80% mark might not be quite as high as the government in Ireland are suggesting. Regardless, it is quite an unseemly row that is developing here. Chris Heaton-Harris, the Northern Ireland Secretary, with his counterpart, Michael Martin, today in London. We're trying to sound uh, conciliatory, but it's clear on listening to Chris Heaton-Harris that they are not going to bend, London that is, to this request from Ireland to have migrants returned back over the border because of the situation with France refusing to take migrants across the channel. This is what he said. The agreement on returns, um, I mean, we've been told all the way through uh, since we left the European Union that the UK must uh, deal with the European Union as a whole entity. And so any, anything on returns has to be dealt, on, dealt with on that basis. And we are obviously um, are working with our European partners because this is a shared endeavour to try and stop criminal gangs um, illegally importing, exporting people, um, uh, human trafficking people across the continent of Europe into the United Kingdom, into Ireland. From our perspective, and I'm very clear that the common travel area generally uh, yeah, and, and that framework has been very beneficial to Irish citizens and to United Kingdom citizens and it covers a lot including uh, migration uh, and uh, both governments are committed to working together in the time ahead um, to dealing with issues, many issues, including uh, migration. Well, rather inconveniently for the government in Dublin, their Supreme Court ruled last month that the UK wasn't 
regarded as a safe third country because of the Rwanda policy. Uh, so they are going to try to push through emergency legislation that they say would allow them to put these migrants back north of the border into the UK. However, Rishi Sunak was quite clear today uh, in saying that that will not happen as long as the UK is not allowed to return migrants to France. Well, Mark White, our Home Affairs and Security Editor, thank you for joining us tonight with that update. Now, joining us now in the studio in Westminster here is Mark Francois, Tory MP for Rayleigh in Wickford and Chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, an anti-EU anti group, and a member of the Defence Select Committee. Mark, welcome to the studio. Evening. Why are you smiling? Well, b because the Irish government are now hoist by their own petard. Chopper. The, 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 the stench of hypocrisy over this is worse than a 10-year-old pint of Guinness that's gone off. I mean, I remember all the way through what I call the Battle of Brexit uh, in the House of Commons being told night after night, week after week, including by people quoting the Irish government and then seeing it in clips from Dublin, no hard border on the island of Ireland under any circumstances, complete free movement across that border. And, you know, as your correspondent rightly pointed out, there was a loophole which was known as the Dublin Convention. And so now to have the Irish government squealing that these rules are against their national interest when they are the people that argued for them for years is you couldn't make it up. Um, uh, Mikhail Martin, of course, at the time Prime Minister, yes. now in London with Christine Harris, the Northern Ireland Secretary, saying that even with on a refugee issue, that border must stay open. We, correct. Now it can't stay open. Did, to what extent do you think, though, that, that this problem emerged last Thursday, the very day the Rwanda bill became law, and now it is law, and now you've got the, the, the Guardian in, in today saying... We're going to start ra rounding up uh, UK asylum seekers. Almost you couldn't pay for advertising if you're the government, I imagine. If you're certainly the PM, would be quite happy with that that headline. Mm. But to what extent is it a real issue? Or are they just trying to blame the UK for their own asylum problem? Well, uh, Mikhail Martin, as you say, at the time of all these arguments, was uh, the Taoiseach. He was the Prime Minister of Ireland. He's now the Foreign Minister, and he said last week that 80% of asylum seekers arriving in Ireland, in the Republic, have come from Northern Ireland because of, his words, the Rwanda effect. So here's the man who a few years ago was saying under no circumstances could there be any kind of border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, now complaining bitterly about what he calls the Rwanda effect. Now... That would seem to imply that, at least in the Republic of Ireland, that legislation is now starting to have a material effect. And don't forget, the European People's Party, the EPP, Ursula von der Leyen and all of those, David Cameron took our MEPs out. I was the project manager for that when I was the <laughs> Shadow Europe Minister. You know the history. The EPP, in their manifesto for the European elections, are now apparently saying, quote, we want to implement the concept of safe third countries. This is the European People's Party. So, who of course were desperately in favour of Theresa May's original deal. No, so, no. so, you know, the whole world tonight is kind of spinning through 180 degrees. And going back towards where, maybe where the UK government is, although what's different, I think, is that Rwanda is a deportation scheme, not a, not a processing scheme. Once you go to Northern the Rwanda, you're not going to come back. And that's the difference, maybe, with what we're looking at within well, the Well, the government has said repeatedly, you should not be able to come into the United Kingdom mm. illegally and be able to stay. So the Rwanda scheme has always been designed as a deterrent. Here's the irony yeah. that a government in the Republic who argued for years for no kind of border control at all are the people that are now telling us in London that it does have a, de have a deterrent effect. Hang on. Mm. It does have a deterrent effect. And, oh, they don't like it. And the scheme is starting to work. I and mean, are you surprised by that? You, you've been concerned about it. You've been concerned about the way it was all structured, weren't you? Yes, no, it, it's... And you it's let the five families in and out of the... Look, it's absolutely true, Chopper, that I and some of my colleagues had uh, concerns about the absolute legal technicalities of the bill. And we'll see how that plays through. Yes. But it does seem that the overall scheme, and now we have the bill has become an act, despite the House of Lords that it is beginning to have an effect. And don't take it from me, as the chairman of the European Research Group, 
take it from the Foreign Minister of the Republic of Ireland. And I say again, <laughs> who for years and years, these people were arguing we could not have any kind of border restriction yep. on the island of Ireland under any circumstances. Well, guess what? It... You know, history appears to have moved on a bit. It's very it? rare we see you so happy in the studio, Mark Franson. Normally you're steaming with anger about this government, but there we are. Uh, another reason why you're happy is the 2.5% uh, target to, to, on GDP spending. You've got an idea of how that money should be spent. Yeah, no, sorry, to be fair, the, this government are absolutely right to stand firm on this, mm. and I hope they'll continue to do so. Now, 2.5%, yes, um, uh, another good decision by the government. And I was delighted uh, last week when we announced we're going to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. Um, I'd like to see it get to 3 but let's not be churlish. 2.5% is a lot better than 2 and that means we can begin to recapitalise our armed forces, we can plug some of the capability gaps that we have. And the most important thing that the Prime Minister said in Poland last week was he was putting the defence industry, in his words, on a war footing because the history shows us the best way to prevent war, to deter war, is by showing any potential aggressor, who may or may not be called Vladimir Putin, mm. that you're prepared to fight and to win. And what project, particularly with the money on, we know Israel was protected by the Iron Dome, wasn't it? From, uh, yes, uh, and that seems attacks. to have been 99% successful. Mm -hmm. We have a very limited air defence system in the United Kingdom. We know from Ukraine that Russia tends to launch massive cruise missile strikes from its bombers. We don't really have an air defence system that's equipped to cope with that. Now that we have these extra resources, as a priority, we should start to invest in creating an iron dome of our own. Well, Marc Francois, senior figure on the Defence Select Committee and, of course, chairman of the European Search Group of Tory MPs. Thank you for coming to the studio and joining us today on GB News. Thank you for having me, Thank you.